Hello, everyone. This is the first session after the introduction session of the PulpCon this year. Um, the theme is Lockless Pulp. And yes, I believe I should start sharing my screen, right? So I hope you can see that. Yep. We can see your screen. Um, if someone else is going to take notes on this, I can switch to the view only mode. I believe that would be helpful. Matthias, I'll take notes. Thank you very much. So um, Lockless Pulp. Um, we have, I, I think we do have a problem in the current architecture around tasks where we use um, the resource manager to distribute tasks to workers and at the same time processing the locking on resources so that no two workers try to access the same resource at the same time. Um, the problem is, or, or there, there can be a lot of problems. One of them is that the resource manager itself is a bottleneck because everything that has to be done must pass the resource manager. This is uh, especially a problem because the orphan cleanup process, for example, only runs on the resource manager and therefore basically blocks operation of pulp for a certain amount of time. Um, when something in the process dies, for example, the worker while the task is performed, the task may be in an inconsistent state. It may, may not be represented in the same way by RQ and pulp. And that might lead to resources that will never be freed again. Um, yeah, at, at the moment, uh, this gives us the possibility to say whatever is set to be or whatever is some um, queue to be performed first on a resource is also done first on the re resource. So this uh, resource manager is basically serializing tasks, at least with respect to single resources. Um, yeah, due to the um, nature of the locking, it may be that one task is performing a very long living task and all other uh, workers are waiting for the next task to be available. And yeah, I said that already often cleanup can just block everything. So um, one very easy approach to locking is to say we don't need locking. And the question is, when do you need locking? Um, there's like, do we have this here? No, I don't. Um, I, I try to summarize the uh, synchronization quadrant, which is if you have data, data can be mutable or data can be shared. And this gives you like four quadrants where you have the quadrant where data is not shared and it's immutable and everything's okay. Then you have the quadrant where data is mutable but not shared, so only accessed by one processor, then there's no problem. Then you can go the other way where you have your data to be immutable, then everyone can read it at the same time without a problem. No one is gonna write it ever. And the only problematic quadrant, which we are in, is the upper right one where the data is mutable and the content is shared. Then you need to synchronize, yeah, access, even read access to this, to this, those objects. Matthias, I need to interrupt briefly. I cannot take notes on your document because it says locked by owner. Only the owner can make edits. I was going to take them right into this doc. Um, 
Are you allowed now? Not yet. Let me refresh, see if that does it. I'm online. I'm in Lockless. No, it still says only the owner can edit this note. Um, I can take notes in a different version if it'll, uh, or just in a different doc, and then we'll put them in later. Why don't we do that? Uh, let me. See, um, this is exactly the problem. The lock is being held in one place. Exactly. Lovely demo of the of the problem you're trying to describe here. Yeah. <laughs> Strongly approve. Yeah, the moment I put the URL to that document in the public place, I had thought it was wise to limit the right. There we go. But yep. I'm giving it back to you now. Okay, I got it. I uh, I just stuck. I can edit. Thank you. Let's hope no one destroys our documents. History's a thing. Okay. Um, yes, and so the idea is uh, we can maybe improve on this situation a lot by not having mutable resources anymore. And the question is, how can we accomplish this? Um, yeah, so one question is, why do we have um, locking today? And one issue is we have the base path problem for distributions. So no distributions can distribute the same con or different content in the same place, obviously. So we need to throw a big lock on this. I think this can be uh, pushed back to a lock on the database level if the distribution can be created atomically. Um, yeah, then we have this uh, FIFO property that whatever we want to do on a resource is performed in the same order. Then we have orphan cleanup, which really, uh, yeah, which uh, performs badly when done in parallel to another sink, because while the sink is running, some resources may look like orphans just to be associated in a minute. Um, yeah, and then we have things like deletion of resources and updating them because we want them synchronized with the already queued sync tasks and other modifications. And the creation of repository versions is also serialized. And yeah, so that a repository can only get one new repository version at a time. Um, yeah, so the idea I want to present here is that we want to try to make everything immutable, or almost everything. We will see that later. And the idea is if all resources were immutable, then they could be used by an unlimited number of processes at the same time without any need for synchronization primitives, which are usually called locks, but maybe should have been called bottlenecks in the first place. Um, one thing I should note here is that we won't be without locking, because there is always some kind of locking, but we should try to rely on the locking that is already in the database and obviously, some levels below that, the processor does locking on memory, for example. So this locking free means we don't have locks in our code base. And once we have that, we obviously don't need a resource manager anymore, which is currently the only uh, task that needs to be run at a singleton in pulp. And that means all then remaining services will be absolutely scalable in a cluster sense. The contrast, obviously, are it's harder to design. If it were easier, we would have been in that 
situation in the first place. And another problem is it needs a new data model. So this is obviously not going to be pulp three, but probably a breaking change that is only valid if we uh, bump the version once more. Um, and to get the discussion started here, I want to uh, present three possible solutions in short, which would be exposed immutability, so immutability. Yeah. So we say everything you put into pulp is immutable from the moment you put it there and there's no way to change anything. This is obviously the easiest one to do. We just uh, delete all the update commands. And maybe it needs to be a little bit cautious about the delete commands. Um, problem is uh, we put all burden to the user and we make it practically impossible for a user to change something behind a natural key, which could be the name of a repository. So yeah, if he wants to change the description of a repository, the answer is no, he can't. Um, then there's another um, idea, which would be delayed immutability. So this is uh, basically, we say the resource starts out in the quadrant where it is mutable, but not shared. So it is owned by one worker until the worker finished its task. And then the resource hops over to the diagonal um, quadrant where it is immutable from then on, but can be shared across all pulp. Um, this can maybe be combined with using the result of tasks as a kind of future so that user can say, once this task is finished, there will be a resource I can use for another task. Um, not sure how complicated that will be. Um, there's some chat going on. Okay. Not about my name. <laughs> Um, but uh, there was obviously a question about natural key. Um, in Pulp, our resources usually have a UUID as a database key, but most of them can also be identified by, for example, a name, which I would call a natural key. And for example, in the case of a repository version, it's the combination of a name and a version. So then the natural key would be the name of the repository and the version number. So natural key is the more, more general term here. Um, yeah, futures would still be waiting on resources. So there is some blocking. And the problem would be, uh, the task may fail and then the result of the future would still not be available as promised. Um, I, I already said repository versions, uh, usually the syncing takes some time and the result of a sync can obviously need not be saved in the database atomically. So in a way, repository versions already implement this model of delayed immutability, because once they are finished, we don't change them anymore. Um, yeah, and then there's a third model where we have a copy on write approach, a bit like uh, objects are handled in the Linux kernel. That's where the uh, inspiration came from, where you say you have a lookup table with natural keys that map to actual objects in another table. And when you want to change them, you create another object in the other table, and then you can switch the name atomically to a new uh, immutable object. And the thing I 
uh, see this would be that the user can only access the resources by their natural key, which is in this uh, referencing database. And once that uh, the, uh, the user wants to perform a task, all the resources can be looked up by their database key and the task now owns those objects so they wouldn't be deleted in the meantime and it is absolutely clear that he will work on the versions once the task was created and the next thing is the task is immediately able to perform because there is no uh, resource he needs to wait on Yes. And the last thing I want to uh, summarize here is that I think we can maybe combine the last two um, schemes in Pulp because we have resources like uh, content view versions, which kind of match to the future or delayed immutability. And we have objects that can basically be changed atomically, like repositories, uh, remotes, and distributions that would, I think, perfectly match to the copy on write approach. So the, um, the second proposal um, features, would this be a move away from um, having a system like RQ that uh you know runs off uh runs separate tasks and like separate processes no um actually now that you say it at the moment we have tasks both represented in the pulp database and in rq which is part of the problem that those two informations can get out of sync um I believe you still need someone to coordinate your workers, but um, it's maybe that the tasks to be done are in the database and the next worker picks a task that is available. Okay. Um, does that answer the question? I think so, yeah. But, so I guess the proposal, yeah. sorry. Um, I guess the proposal would be like we'd have one one queue and then workers would pick off uh, the next task on that queue rather than either that or they are just pushed to the next uh, that they are just um, yeah, just put to the RQ queue. There's no um, yeah, the, the thing is that a task once, defined is able to run at that very moment. So the next available worker can get it. So it can just be in a queue. And I think that is implemented in our queue that you have one queue and four workers to pick their tasks from there. Yep. So right now we have the initial queue that the resource manager reads from. And instead of it just being the resource manager that reads from that queue, it would be all the workers reading from that queue. Yes. So right now we've got we we've got our code can rely on ordering because of that because of because of the problem we're trying to solve. What it gives us is I know that if I do a thing before you do a thing, then my stuff is going to be completed before yours is. Um, and some of the things that need to happen in pulp still need to be able to specify that kind of, I need to do these things in order. I need to have, you know, the repo has to be created before the remote is created, before the sync can happen. How would that kind of processing be, uh, would, would it, how would that exist, I guess, in the, in the lockless world? Um, the, the copy on write thing would be a, 
uh, atomic thing, so that wouldn't even trigger a task. So once you have the um, call to create a repository finished, you have the repository. So you can just take that repository and define the sync task with it. Grant, I actually think that nothing would really change um, in that respect. My video is frozen. Can everyone still hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear we you. Hear you. Okay. Um, because uh, when you make a request to like sync a repository or uh, or do a publish, um, <clears throat> the view set will actually synchronously in that first request, like go look up whatever resource it was. So if you say, you know, sync this repository with this remote, if that remote doesn't exist, it won't it won't work at all. There's there's yes. no delayed. Um, yeah. So the way it currently is, is everything has to exist when you first make the, uh, uh, the API call. Exactly. And how yeah. would, yeah. Um, how would like, so for version creation, let's say I'm adding uh, units and like today, for example, maybe in Catello, we make multiple calls to create uh, three new versions. And we only really care about the newest one because we're like adding three batches of things. Um, what would happen in this world? Um, so you say you trigger like three calls to change the repository version or Yeah, well, so it's possible to say you cannot start a new task that changes or the, the repository content while one is running. And I think that's the only way to meet the, the um, requirement that every task can immediately start to run. So that would kind of push the locking back to the user. So the user must wait for the repository to be in a state where it can get the next sync action or add content action. Justin, do you see a world where that's possible for the client to do the waiting? I mean, it's definitely possible more annoying but possible <laughs> so uh, and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask questions here mostly because i'm having trouble wrapping my head around what this actually looks like so if i'm asking questions that sound like i'm saying this is a terrible idea that is not my thing at all it's mostly my brain is terrible not the idea um so i'm going to drill down a little bit on this trying to figure out what this looks like from the user's point of view of pulp 4 or pulp n whatever we would do this I want to do what Justin's talking about. There's an existing repository. It has repository version 27. And I'm adding uh, content to it in batches, let's say, because I have so many. So I'm going to add 100 units three times. And what I want at the end of that is all 300 units are in there. And I want to know what the version, I want to be working with the resulting version. So right now, I can say, I want to add you know, batch one, batch two, batch three, they all get queued up and the resource manager handles making sure that they get processed in order. And I'm gonna, you know, I, I can keep querying, I get the tasks back and I can wait till that final task says it's complete and then I can get the resulting mm -hmm. version. That's the way we, we, we would do that currently. It's kind of fire and forget, you're just looking at the last task. In this context, the user would say, I wanna create a new version and hand a hundred units off to, to pulp. And would immediately say, I want to create a new a new version. But before doing that, he'd have to say, is the repository ready to take more? Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. OK. Um, and and you could go ahead. Go ahead. Dennis. Well, I was going to say an alternative solution to this is having an API that lets you specify these 300 units as three separate calls. The reason mm -hmm. this is happening is because the 
the size of the request is limited, you know? And so you could have another, a separate API that lets you specify those units. So Pulp is already aware of all those 300 units. And then you have a call to add those to a repository version where you still have a single task um, that is actually handling it for you. Sure. You still end up effectively though with, with the, the repository itself, whether, whether I'm waiting or whether we hand tell Pulp, here's all of my stuff. And Pulp says, okay, I'm doing the thing that you asked me to. And somebody else says, oh, I want to add content to that repository. Mm -hmm. We still have that, that, that synchronization right. issue in there somewhere. Um, so going lockless doesn't prevent us from, uh, I'm not waiting. prevent, doesn't allow us to ignore the fact that things have to happen in order, that that order matters for a certain class of problem. And that's the thing I'm most try having trouble getting my head around is how do we guarantee order in the cases where order really, really matters? Like if I add a piece of content and then delete it, and then I look, it's not there. If I delete the content before it exists, then I get an error because it isn't there, and then I add it, and now it's there. And clearly those two states matter. Um, how do we guarantee that is the thing I'm having trouble getting my head around. Yeah. Actually, for adding and deleting content, it could just be made synchronously because there's no waiting on external services involved. So it's, it's content already in Pulp. It's more like I create a new content, new version with that content. That may just be doable without a task even. Right. And at the moment, we need to make it a task because that's the only way to lock on it. Right. Yeah, the, the other reason that we make it a task is um, to allow for the web server's um, timeout concerns. So sometimes some operations, like for instance, step solving, uh, take longer than maybe even five minutes. So by running, that's one of the other motivations for us to run items in the background. Yes, I mean because there are going to so there's a, there's like multiple levels of um, tasking involved here, and even if we were to do the, the the lockless approach, Brian, I think we would still want to do have the REST API behave the way it does now, where you make a request and you get a task back that says this is what you can monitor to see when it's done, precisely because there's a web server in between that needs to be detached from waiting for the back end to do the, whatever it is it's doing. Um, so that I don't think can go away in order to, to make this, to make some, make pulp work for the, for the rest case. Um, I'm still, I'm just kind of grappling with, and it's, if I'm the single user, there's a set of problems that are relatively easy to solve. If I have six people all trying to affect, affect the same repository, then they're all independent. It gets a lot more exciting about, uh, you know, ordering and locking and, and making sure that that happens. Um, and I scheduling guess on a, things. Scheduling is a is a whole thing. It's true. Well, well that's just one of the users, right? I want to I want to arrange for a sync to happen at midnight, whether that's a an automated thing or whether somebody has to log on at midnight and push the button. It's still a, a third or another user rather than just me, whoever I am. Um, Matthias, I'm assuming this um, is kind of on a tangent. I'm assuming there's lots of research here. Can you add to this document after we're done? Can you add links to like the 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 way this works elsewhere? Because it I Clearly, you've done. You've gotten a lot of. You've got a lot of notes. If you could, well, if you could throw those originals in, that'd most, be great. Mostly out of my head. <laughs> there is a video um, that um, uh, Matthias could share. Yeah, right. I, I will find some about this problem, but it doesn't really provide a clear solution for our use case. Okay. It just okay. kind of gives a background on locks. But I, I want Matthias to try to sum, Matthias summarize it very quickly. Okay. <laughs> I want to take another turn on this. Um, I want to uh, schedule tasks one after another. The moment at the moment we have a situation where you can schedule a delete and then a sync to the same repository after that, or you can schedule an update. And then a user looks up the remote is at the right URL and he schedules a sync, but the sync is scheduled after the update. And now it will sync from a different place. 
So I think most of the problems you just described are problems we already have. Yeah, that's a good point. So this first in, first out is not the solution to those, at least. Um, can we yeah. talk about the can we talk about the um, the update case? I'm trying not to focus completely on content. I know that all of us, that's mm -hmm. the thing that we live in. So that's, um, but it's a, it's a specific use case. I have, there's, if there's an entity out there, the entity that exists in pulp and there's multiple uh, users of this pulp instance that all know about that entity, whatever it is, whether it's a repository or a user, um, uh, or a particular piece piece of content. Up above here, you talk about uh, if we take the repository as a, as a specific instance, mm -hmm. it has a key, it has the, the UUID, but it also has the repository name or possibly name and type. We've talked about making those together be the, the key. Um, but it also has a bunch of fields that are not the key. They're just things about the repo, as, we, as you described. Description is a good one. Um, I think the only one, but yes. Yes. Um, and when I think about similar content in like the pulp RPM world, if you think about an update record, an erratum has a description. Yeah. Technically, the description is not part of the key, but every time it changes, you have to know because you've now changed the the thing that that, that describes that. So the the there's a uh, the update record has a hash that says this is the the digest of everything in this update record, and that's the real key. You can change whatever you want, but this is the real key. Would we need to do something similar for every entity to, in order to be able to recognize that this is a new copy, a new thing? Um, I believe we already have content to be immutable by design. So all of those are not the um, none of the concerns here. So whenever you upload a package to Pulp, it gets analyzed and it creates a content unit and that will never be changed again. Yep. At least to my understanding. So this is really only, or only, I mean, mostly about um, repositories, remotes, and distribution. We would need to figure out how to deal with those, correct? Is that exactly. in this world? Exactly. OK. So everything that's not already immutable by design. Right. Right. So we're, we are a ways down the path already to making this possible just because of some of the basic assumptions of pulp is what I'm hearing, which is a good thing. Yeah, right. A lot of yeah. the important stuff already is, is prepared to play in this world. Repo version is already prepared to play in this world. Did you change anything about the repo? Yes, you get a new repo version. Exactly. So we're this isn't a starting from scratch. This is how do we how do we close all the windows? Is that correct? That is correct. And one solution would obviously be if you have a repository, you cannot change its description anymore. But I think that's not a nice option. And so we will probably not focus on the first approach. It's just there for completeness. Yep. And so can you talk a little bit more? I, and perhaps you already said this, but the combination of the last two approaches. Yes, I think uh, there are, or at least there's one resource, which is the repository version, which quite naturally fits to the second approach. Um, exports maybe two. I don't know. While stuff like exporters, remotes, and uh, yeah, repositories themselves do match the third approach best because they can, yeah, be changed atomically. 
you say, I want a new description there, and you immediately get the answer. While all tasks that still access that repository will work with the old version. And once a real object is not referenced anymore by a name or a task, it can be deleted. And would this delete occur whenever something is removing the reference? And I know I'm talking about implementation here, but. Yeah, either that or some kind of garbage collection. OK. But this kind of garbage collection doesn't need the big lock on everything, because it can just pick up what is left over. And everything that is in pulp that is still used as referenced by something. Yeah, and these references are basically foreign keys and tables. Yes, in some way. And once it has no reference, it can never be referenced again, right? Yes. At least from the outside, it cannot be looked up again because it has no name attached. And the other thing that can reference it is a task, and that might go unfinished. What will the user experience when, say, they change the remote URL and issue a sync, and there's still the old one and the copied new one, and the sync is in progress, and say there's a few users in the system? Won't, are there, is it, are there concerns about understanding what's going on? in terms of what will this sync produce? What would another sync produce? What, when you look at the state of that thing that was changed, what, the, what are you shown? Um, this has come up before. This is not going to help with any audit tool. Auditing should be done elsewhere. So if you want to know who changed my repository at which point in time, that's a different question. Um, well, you trigger the sync by specifying the remote by its name. And at that time, the name will be looked up. And whatever the remote tells you at that time will be used in the sync. That's the idea. So if you change the remote and uh, trigger the sync immediately after that, there's a high chance that you get what you just changed. If that answers your question. If you have another administrator in your system and he's trying to, yeah, and he, he's interfering with your work, then you're in trouble today and you will be in trouble with this solution. So what I'm hearing, Matthias, is that RBAC is going to save us from this. If done correctly, or let's say if uh, implemented, uh, yeah. If you trust all your administrators. And I, bet I think this is the, the uh, user experience with almost all systems where you have access for multiple users. If someone changes something for everyone, then it's changed. And if you don't want them, don't give them the rights. So the confusion factor of I changed it and then I read the entity and it's different than what I changed it to because you changed it and, and one, in some sense, it came afterwards, is going to happen regardless, yeah, whether you're using no condition. locking or locking. That's a race condition in any place, and in, in, in both ways, yeah. And it's so, yeah, but, ahead, but we handle that problem, but we handle that problem differently today. I mean, we don't really have this problem today because the asynchronous updates, all the updates being asynchronous, they are all linearized. Um, yes, but, uh, and so, 
So the, the, the while two users can race to, to set something, um, the system pr still preserves their first come first serve order. And at any time when you read, uh, if you if if user A dispatches the task and user B dispatches the task and say the thing being changes the sync URL, at any time, uh, everyone can look at the remote that would be used and know, well, my sync hasn't happened yet. It's gonna it's gonna use this one. Actually, if the second update hasn't happened too, then you can look now and see what the sync will not use. So it can be that the other update that changes it to a, the wrong URL and the sync are still queued. And now you look and think, well, my sync will run properly and then it gets updated and the sync starts. It's just yeah. we have another window for the race condition at the moment. They just look different. This is making my head hurt. I, I'm, and this is, again, that's not a this is a bad design <laughs> problem. That's a thinking about concurrent problems like this are always painful. And I'm trying to get the visualization set in my head. And I'm trying to say that this is not a problem we will introduce here, or we would introduce with this. Yeah, it's there's not, always uh, this race condition between the user doing a read to see what the information is right now versus uh, when a certain task runs in the future and yes. what the information will be then. And the only way to handle that would be to give the lock to the user. So Ouch. that you say, I'm going to have the, the access on this resource until I'm finished syncing and then I give it back. The user, not the resource manager, but the individual it, it, who yeah. set who's who set who has a and I'm going to go down this path just a bit to get it set in my head. That would be along the lines of there's an API where a user, the external to pulp user says, I am locking repository X exactly. and he gets back. A, OK, you, the user, are now holding it and now the user can do whatever he wants. And if a second user says, I need I want to update repository X, he's told to go go fish because somebody else has it locked. Yes. So that's. And then if user A never comes back, then everything falls over and you have to restart pulp because it's holding no, locks. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, well, the idea is that you don't actually hand the lock to the user. It's just that operation while it's running, it has the lock on it. And nothing else can get in line to get that lock until that lock is released automatically. I see. Which is still, but that's still subtly different than what we're doing today. It's yeah. a more exposing, it's a more exposed lock. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, time check, we have five minutes. Oh, goodness. Um, I wanted to mention something, and this probably will not be a popular opinion, uh, but as a user, a uh, heavy user of Pulp 3, mm -hmm. um, I would maybe ask that you look at the problems that you had uh, specified that are leading you in this direction. And like, I, I get that the solutions here definitely solve those and, and that's great. They're large changes with maybe some not fully understood consequences for users. Um, so think, but things like orphan cleanup, like that's a big problem. I get that that's a big problem. Resource manager existing maybe is, is like more of a medium problem orphan cleanup makes it worse. Mm -hmm. And then there's kind of a lot of other small problems that I feel like maybe are more perceived problems than actually like user reported issues, you know, um, which as developers, we, we try to anticipate. Uh, so I guess, you know, my, my suggestion is maybe try to figure out if there's a solution for the big problem that doesn't involve a giant change from the user's perspective and not say and i'm not saying don't you know go to a lockless pulp but maybe in the more medium term there's a solution that doesn't break all the users in very subtle ways um but actually solves the majority of the issue and if there's not you know then that that's fine too 
Mm -hmm. what yeah, and um, orphan cleanup needs to be changed, maybe anyway. Yeah, and this is a conversation that we've we've been having in IRC a little bit, and we've talked about this a little bit before Matthias as well. And um, orphan cleanup is uh, a big problem, and so is the resource manager is a medium problem. I think that's graded correctly. And um, I didn't want to take away from the content and preparation for this session because uh, it's, a, it's a conversation in and of itself. Um, but if we're considering solutions for those problems, there are other options um, aside from the ones written here. And for example, um, we, could, uh, we could allow for orphan cleanup to not stop all other tasks. And orphans could be cleaned up um, either periodically, and that's a task that runs in parallel, or uh, as needed, um, so that the last reference to a particular orphan content unit deletes it. That's the ref count garbage collection strategy. Um, in both of those cases, the architecture would be that, uh, well, you wouldn't have an orphan cleanup operation anymore because orphans just get cleaned up on its own. Pulp just handles that. Um, and really to make that happen, like, well, why wouldn't we do that right away? To make that happen, what we would need to do is we would need to have better error handling in places where uh, any time that you, ch in your plugin or pulp core code, you check for a piece of content in the database, and then moments later, you go to associate that comment in the database. So for example, in the stages API, the stages API queries the database and says, oh, I have content one, two, three, four. And then like 30 seconds later, it actually goes to associate content unit one, two, three, four. Oh, wait, someone deleted it in between. So if we could address that um, error recovery, um, which would be to recreate the content unit, download it, something like that, um, you know, or perhaps we just delay the deletes so that they're around still for some amount of reasonable expected time to just avoid the, the missing content, um, then that's a, that's a way to solve that problem as well. Um, and there's another solution that I think is pretty straightforward for the resource manager to eliminate it completely. But for the sake of time, I will tell you all about that at a later session. Um. I want to add the resource manager maybe a bit more than a medium problem because in my opinion, it's the reason for the hanging tasks we have experienced with the salary as well as with RQ now. And we can, we can talk about a pretty straightforward way about how we can eliminate the resource manager as well. Um, in fact, it's so easy, even though we're at our time, I'll tell you now. Uh, it would be to use etcd, um, which will give us a all workers a consistent data store. Mm -hmm. And uh, you save the locks that things would be needed in the database. Oh, wait, we do that already. And instead of routing something to the resource manager to then be routed to a worker, workers um, are able to use the consistent view to determine which worker is uh, owning which locks. Um, and you would only have workers, you wouldn't have a resource manager, and we would still process tasks in the same order we do today. So the question for some of these, like we, let's say we get rid of resource manager, that doesn't change the public API. Is that a pulp three dot X thing, or is that a pulp four level change? I think three dot, because it's a significant significant improvement and it does come with a change but it's uh that's my take on it i mean to justin's point of um users of pulp are going to recognize that there are some things that could really stand to be cleaned up now as opposed to uh with a with a redesign now some of that might just be we, we address it and we release it as the next 3.x release or we can address that by saying, yes, there's going to be a pulp four. It has some really significant changes, but the, the move from three to four isn't going to be four years from now. And the migration isn't going to be any harder than updating from 3.10 to 3.12. 
Um, but that's all discussion to be, you know, to be had in terms of how maybe it'll factor into Dennis's major releases and, and how we make that happen. Um, but I think Justin's point, the, I'm going to reinforce Justin's point, is that there are problems that we already know that are problems because we already have real users reporting them as problems mm -hmm. that we'd like to be able to solve without having to completely redesign the guts of Pulp 3. And how can we do that is definitely a good question to ask. Cool. We're at our time. Okay. Um, and perhaps we should schedule another session. I know that there was another slot. Um, I'd say at this point, thank you for the discussion. It was very good and helpful. And I'm going to stop recording at this moment then. <laughs>